time it is. Marvin Devine, Hoover, Axel, and you know how we do. <laughs> yeah, I got the juice, yeah, I got the juice We game cool, make them look like cool Always play cool, that's the biggest rule Fuck that what they doing, keep on doing Make sure it sound right, boys. Thank you for showing up. All right. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Don't be stingy. All right. Please share this. All right. Smash that share button. All right. Because we need to get this story out there. All right. You're in for a treat. Put some cool whip on it. All right. It's going to be sweet. All right. So I've got a good show tonight. We've got a terrific interview. All right. I've got Josh Allen here tonight as the kidney patient we're spotlighting. All right, I'm the I'm the host. All right, the Warriors Quest show. You know how we do. All right, and at, on the Warriors Quest show every week. All right, we spotlight a kidney disease patient, a kidney warrior. All right, who's looking for a living kidney donor. All right, and tonight we have our special guest. Our special special interview is Josh Allen. All right, and so I'm going to bring him on. All right, Josh Allen is from New Mexico, but he's living in and around the Seattle, Washington area. All right, so man, I'm I'm super excited to get this going. Hey, look, thanks for watching. Kay Blanchard is watching. Hey, what's up, Steve? All right, all right, all right, all right. Hey, Steve Belcher's watching. Thanks for watching, Steve. All right, everybody, please, if you're watching, please share this. Let's get this out there. All right, please don't be stingy. All right, so let's get this information out there so we can spotlight this kidney warrior. Get this shared. Um, comment, please, more comments. 
Let's make this interactive. Ask a question. All right. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to show your question on the screen. If you ask a question and we're going to make this interactive and we're going to make sure that we get your, that you get his story out there, Josh Allen's story. All right. So you know how we do. All right. We're going to get this going. All right. We're going to rock this tonight. So I'm going to get, I'm, I'm going to do a very, very special intro, a VIP intro for our guest. I'm going to bring him on. All right, so here we go. Here we go. VIP intro. Hey, thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining me on the Warriors Quest show. Thank you. I really like that intro. It's a really fun one. <laughs> thanks. It's a little whimsical love, on the end, huh? Yeah, I love hearing that baby. Is it laughing or squealing? Yeah, or it's giggling, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people like that because in the beginning, it kind of builds some momentum. And then on the end, it kind of tapers off and it gets a little whimsical. So thanks, man. I actually did. I put that together myself and I... I thought if at the end with the curtains closing, it would be funny to add a, a baby giggling, you know, laughing. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> All right. So um, we were talking off on, offline just a little bit. And, uh, you know, and, and I'd like to kind of uh, put you guys solo um, and introduce yourselves. So you had uh, mentioned that you're from New Mexico originally, um, but now you're living in and around the Seattle, Washington area. So. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, like, uh, you know, um, your origin story. I always say that every hero has an origin story, right? You know, even Bruce Wayne, you know, when he was growing up, had something that made an impact before he became Batman, right? Well, I want to I hear your origin story. Tell us how you grew up and, and then kind of uh, how you guys met. And let's uh, kind of go from there, all right? Okay. Yeah, so um, I grew up in a small town called Gallup, New Mexico, um, probably for, forever when I was young. <laughs> and I moved to um, Seattle when I was about 23 years old. Um, what actually brought me here to Seattle is my wife behind me. She's born and raised here, and she came to Gallup um, to teach. And she was teaching a seventh grade science at a middle school there, and I was substitute teaching a math class next to her. And when I first met her, I actually thought she hated me. Um, <laughs> she, she has a, what we call RBF. And she was what is that? Resting beautiful face. Uh, <laughs> and, um, I'm just playing. I, I know what that means, but I was just trying to see if you'd actually say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be nice. Um, I'm also in um, hand reach, so. And she was down there, and finally, one day, I go into the coffee room, and she was eating lunch, and I was like, oh, I guess I should talk to her. So I looked at her, and said, hi, how are you doing? She's really good. I said, oh, what are you eating? She goes, oh, I was eating lunch. I was like, oh, it looks like dog food. <laughs> and um, we started talking a little bit more, and one thing left to another, we started hanging out, and then we started dating, and I was so shy on it, I didn't actually lean in first. She did. And she kissed me, and the whole time she's kissing, I'm like, okay, what do I do? Do okay, do and then you know led to that, and yeah. then, um, she got a call. So we started dating for about a year in Gallup, and then she got a call to interview in Seattle at mm -hmm. a school here, and she interviewed, and it was offering quite a bit of money. And while she's doing that, I was having issues with the school I was at, and with the job, I just wasn't getting the sub calls. And I was like, you know what? I said, if your parents are willing to help me, help um, have me as well, I said I would love to be able to go to Seattle with you. She said, okay. So she interview, um, interviewed, got the job, and we moved to Seattle. So that's kind of how I ended up in Seattle. And I moved here with no school, uh, no job, anything like that. And I said, I'll come anyways. So I moved here to Seattle, and I started off at a middle school in Renton as the ISS guy or the okay. school suspension supervisor. Uh -huh. So anytime a kid get in trouble, get suspended, whatever, they came and they saw me. 
So that was my job for two years. And that was actually the first job I interviewed, got it. And I actually got my, while doing that, I got my ed degree at um, WGU. So I went to school there for four years and it, it worked for a while. And one of the other reasons I actually moved to Seattle was the healthcare. The healthcare in Gallup, it's very spotty and there were issues. And what I found out is they put me on Cellcept and they were just keeping me on Cellcept, keeping the immune system away because what I had, what, what I had was NPGN. And what is that? Uh, membrane, membranial proliferated glomerular nephritis. Okay. Uh, basically an autoimmune disease where the immune mm -hmm. system attacked the kidneys and it happened when I was nine. So I ended up getting strep throat at nine years old, um, activated the immune system. The immune system attacked my kidneys. Okay. And it put me in the hospital back in March and I was in the hospital for a month while they so were figuring out what's going on. Is that very similar to lupus? Um, I don't know what lupus is. All right. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wish I could say yes or no. Yeah. Um, it just one. reminds me of it because it's an autoimmune um, disease, but, but that's interesting. So it attacked your kidneys. Okay. Yeah. So that happened when I was nine and they put me on prednisone, uh, killed my immune system, and then they jump-started my kidneys, basically what it was. And they put me on Cellcept after just to keep my immune system from attacking my kidneys. Mm -hmm. um, when I finally moved back to, uh, when I moved here to Seattle, I started seeing a new nephrologist and she said, you know, when was the last time you had a biopsy? And I said, when I was nine. She said, yeah, let's get you in. I was about 24 when this happened. And she said, yeah, we need a new biopsy. So I did a biopsy and they found out the immune system was in a remission and it wasn't attacking my kidneys anymore. So they said, yeah, you actually don't have NPG and you have IgA nephropathy. Oh, wow. And, um, so the diagnosis actually changed from NPG to IgA nephropathy. And they took me off um, Cellcept. And I think within three years, they said, okay, we need you to lose weight because you're going to need a transplant. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, I was about 300 pounds. So I'm, I'm still a big dude, but I was a really big dude. Yeah, and, you don't look like you're 300 pounds now. <laughs> no, no, I was, yeah, I was 300 pounds. And they're like, uh -huh. well, you got to lose weight. Okay. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I'm a slacker. Um, I just, you know, I don't believe it until it actually happens. It's like, Josh, your kidneys are going to shut down. You need to lose weight. And... I think it was finally the November of 2019, I finally started getting serious about losing the weight, and I really started losing it, and I think December of 2019, they're like, all right, Josh, your kidneys had enough. I think my cran level was at, like, 12. You just got so sick. It just kind of progressed, and as we started to try, every time we tried to start kick-starting the weight loss, it would kick you into not feeling good and not having any energy. And so it became this kind of nasty cycle of not being able to lose weight because you felt like crud and it kind of like the whole fall of 2019 just kind of, yeah, it took a lot of, me. it just escalated. To I the can only imagine you do anything. You were sick. Yeah. More days. Later, and not. it was a big push. I'm a person where I don't like not doing anything. And for me, doc, my doctor said the fact that your cran, you were able to get it to at least a 12. She said, most people, we put them on dialysis or transplant like at a five. And they said, you got it all the way to a 12 before you ended up having to be on dialysis. And it was to a point where I think in January, they said, we need to talk about dialysis. Uh, we need to get a port put in. And February came, or end of January, they said, we got to put the port in. And we did mm -hmm. it. February 13th, we put the port in. February 13th? February That's not a lucky number. Well, it's funny. The next day we went to a concert. No, it's oh. two days. Sorry, two days after we went to a concert. Uh -huh. And it was the last concert we went to. It was, um, I'm a jazz guy. I love jazz. And we went and listened to uh, Mindy Bear. So we went to a jazz concert two days after having the surgery because I was like, no, it's Valentine's Day. We're going to go do something. All right. Was, all right. So I was in pain. I was tired. I was exhausted. But I was not missing that concert. And I was actually very happy because who knew that would be the last concert for a while. Mm -hmm. So. I put the, we did that, and we had the port put in February 13th, February 16th, we did the concert, and we were talking that I'm going to be starting dialysis pretty soon, and Taylor was trying to get medical leave, but the only way we do it is if she got married. Um, so we were talking at that, and that's all that was, was just a little bit of talking, and February, March... 
first. Well, we had, you had, so training for the peritoneal dialysis was the second week of March. Mm -hmm. And we were all panicked about how things were going to work out with timing and school and time off work. When we went into the nephrologist's office the last week of February, and she took one look at him and literally ran out of the room. Wow. Why? Um, I was shaking. He was it was so bad. That so is that it. visible? He was pale. Yeah. He was sick. It just basically the surgery to put the catheter in for dialysis kind of took the rest out of him. Anything that he had kind of been hanging on to was just his body was like, and we're done. And so he um, was so sick and he wasn't eating and he just had no energy and he couldn't go to work at this point. I was... I trying like was it trying was me like <laughs> that appointment we went to i actually drove from work like i worked that day okay and went to the appointment after work and person's like yeah you're taking yeah, off she's tomorrow. like nope you're done <laughs> I'm like, you're, like, you're not going back to work and you're starting emergency start dialysis <laughs> like that monday and wow so wow. we started emergency start dialysis and i was still kind of panicking about school so we have, that was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We did he did his first dialysis and stayed home the days in between. And I went into work. And the next week we took off completely for training. And that Thursday I got the call: change your sub plans. Um, kids are coming in for two day for two hours to get stuff, and then they're going to be gone for two weeks because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so- he got the call that they were cut shutting on Monday. I think. And we never went back. Saw those kids. So <laughs> it was we never went back. What happened is COVID hit two weeks after starting dialysis. Okay. And a lot of people are like, yeah, this sucked. It actually benefited me. Um, because one, I didn't have to take the medical leave that I uh-huh. thought I was having to take, which would have gave me a pay cut. Yeah. So I ended up not having to take the medical leave. I was still able to work. So that online. helped you. Okay. I was able to stay home and I was actually able to lose about 30 pounds at that time. So we started working on the weight loss journey. I was hiking. I was going out. There was so much I started doing because I also got so much energy from doing PD. Yeah. I never knew. What I've, I was like, I've oh, heard that. Wow. I've heard that from other kidney patients that they have more energy because they're dialyzing more regularly than other kidney warriors that do dialysis three days a week. Yeah, you know? it is. And I pull off about 900 to about 1300 milliliters of fluid every night and that's wow. like not just the dialysate that's just extra fluid that's coming off mm-hmm. every night so there's a lot of toxins that are coming off and, this, yeah. and it does it gives me so much energy for it so it helped and then the next year since education all schools were remote i was still able to work because i was supposed to be at work at 7 30 every morning okay which meant that i would have to be in at 9 a.m or, or 9 p.m i'd have to be on my machine at 9 p.m to be up at 6 a.m to get up to leave at 6 45 and be there on time okay it just would have been way too much and i'm like it's just gonna be it's uh, it's a lot because i yeah. work about 30 to 45 minutes away depending on traffic mm-hmm. i was like i just it's not gonna work and staying remote really benefited me and the kids i worked with um i worked in what we call ilc which is inclusive learning center so students with uh severe learning disabilities um, okay their cognitive levels between kindergarten third grade and middle uh-huh. school and those were the students I worked with, and I loved them. You know, I made it very lighthearted. We had a lot of fun doing it remote as much as we could, and the kids loved it. I, I told them, I said, we need to worry about SEL, our social-emotional learning, and just getting the kids at least just worrying about their emotional health as we do academic as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And we made it a lot of fun, and as I was able to do that, we still were able to get growth. Mm-hmm. And I was able to prove that with data as I was keeping it, even though I was just a para. Okay. You know, the teacher, she was old and just had issues, but we had it. And we um, did that. And I think by the spring, I was able to finally get my degree, uh, my bachelor's, and I started applying for new jobs. And I got a teaching job here in Seattle that's about five minutes away from my house, which made it when we went in. Five first, minutes away? Five minutes. Yeah, I wow. Timed it too. Yeah, yeah, I timed it. Five minutes away, so it allowed me to get on machine later if anything uh-huh. happens. And the school I'm at is just so accommodating. They, wow, they that's so, so cool. Much. Yeah. I how just, did you How did you get so lucky to find a job that's only five minutes away? 
And what's funny is I didn't even know how to pronounce the school. That, <laughs> that opened doors. I mean, yeah, it, just, it, did. it took, all worked perfectly. We took a leap of faith coming up here when I had uh -huh. a job and he didn't. And I kind of looked at him and I was like, what are we doing? And he goes, we've talked about getting up to Seattle. You want to go home. We've been talking about needing better medical care. And he goes, God's going to open that door. Yeah. And he goes, let's take that leap of faith. And we did. And like he said, he got the first job and it, it just played out. And when we both last spring actually started looking at new jobs and because I had a really long commute too, and it was really hard um, as his primary caregiver, when he started to get sick in November and I was trying to split my time between my kids commuting 45 minutes plus to work, taking care of Josh and figuring out, you know, can I get home in time if there's a problem or right. what, or how am I going to do this? And it just started to really take um, a really big mental toll on both of us. And that was when last spring we both kind of looked at each other and being home really um, helped me be able to be there for my kids and be there for Josh. And we both said we, we need to look for different jobs. And so um, we put it out there and looked for different jobs. And I got a job seven minutes away from home. So we both you know, got, got open what? these doors and it yeah. just, it, it it played just worked out. perfectly. Um, so, amazing. Wow. And so we're both at new jobs and and just absolutely um it's really nice being close to home and knowing that if something happens to him he can get home or if he's home and i'm at school i can get home yeah um and that's just kind of it, it's this whole journey has been a lot of ups and downs and sideways and like we think we're on this path and all of a sudden we're not on this path and um but we've got so much support and um you know things like this will just kind of happen where we're like okay there's there's a plan and we've had a lot of um ups and downs even just in the last couple months as we started this transplant evaluation journey and and looking for a donor and mm -hmm. we just are kind of keeping that faith that like there's All someone right. out there and it's gonna work and i just want to make a somebody had posted something about it's important to teach, teach show the different options of treatment that's out yes. there and i think that's yes that's i'll put that up again right yeah um because that made a big difference in our life um when we heard dialysis both of us really only knew about chemo and we mm -hmm. were really it was hard it was really hard. And once they started to say, here are these different things, we realized that. Um, the only option I had in Gallup was hemo. Um, okay. That's all that was That's all they thing. talked about. And, that's and all it was, once your kidneys are done, you go on hemo. There wasn't ever really talk about a transplant, prepared to mm -hmm. know or anything. It was literally hemo. That's all I ever heard. Hemo until you die. And to me, <laughs> I used to say, you know, I'm not doing hemo. I said, well, yeah. my kidneys are done, I'm done. And when peritoneal was offered to me and it was offered you know, this is everything you can do. And I looked at the benefits. I was like, you know what? This is worth it. I said, this is something I'm willing to do. You know, it, it doesn't mean it's easy. I mean, it's hard. It is really hard. I mean, I really miss being able to stay up till 10 p.m. doing whatever I want and not having to worry about, okay, what time am I going to get up in the morning? Or, you know, oh, I'd love to go stay at this one place, but I got to lug a 30-pound machine. And how many boxes do I need to take with me? And, you know, there's so much that goes into I found it. I'm really good at packing the car. Yeah. Really good like, <laughs> let's talk, a little, let's talk a little bit about that because, uh, you know, offline before the show, we kind of talked a little bit about that. So um, when, uh, you know, when you chose uh, peritoneal dialysis PD, uh, what were the, some of the, the things that kind of struck you? What, what really, um, you know, made you decide, Hey, this is going to be more for me. And this is going to fit, you know, this is going to be a better modality for me. The one of the biggest, I think would be, um, the freedom that it offered. Uh, like I said, I teach full time. I go, I'm working on my master's degree and I'm going to school full time. And there's other things I want to do as well. And I felt like if I did hemo, it would have just taken so much energy out of me because it is, it's taking blood out of you where peritoneal, it's just, filling your belly with water or yeah. sugar water sugar water right all this stuff as a magnet and then draining it all out every night uh -huh. and what i call is i call it um i call it belly urine um I tell, <laughs> belly I, I what belly urine. that's what i call it belly urine <laughs> belly urine because that's what it is if you it really urine, is yeah urine. essentially yeah 
so I call it belly urn. I said, yeah. yeah, I'm going to drop my belly urn. It just came out. And, you know. <laughs> and it stuck. It stuck. <laughs> and it does. It, just, it does exactly what, you know. You yeah, your, do, your, your kidneys are supposed to do. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. it lets us be spontaneous. Um, we just, I don't know, a few weeks ago, we were, we have a cabin that we like to go to and we'll go for a day or two days and sometimes mm-hmm. we'll go for like three or four or five and it'll kind of extend. And so the idea of having to like be back in the city for this schedule was just, um, it was really defeating. You know, the purpose of dialysis is to live and there's living and then there's really truly living and yes, yes. I think that sometimes we get lost in the difference of those things. And um, even when we started PD and we chose it because of the ability to be spontaneous and to live and that kind yeah. of thing, we we did a little bit of that, but it wasn't really until actually this last August when it started to kind of hit us that we've been doing this for a year and a half and it got really um, tedious and really tough that we looked at each other. There was a meteor shower, and the best time to see it is at like what? Two a.m. Two a.m. And I had kind of said, "Well, what about your dialysis?" And Josh goes, "What about it? I'll still do it." Yeah. So <laughs> we drove. Uh, she, my her family owns a cabin in Port Gamble, Washington. All right, all right. I, I when I was scrolling your Instagram, I think I saw a little bit about that. Was, this will be interesting to hear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> first, I gotta say because I saw his long. Hi, mom. <laughs> I just saw that. Um, right. So the place we went is called Deer Park in the Olympic National Forest uh, because there's a place that was the darkest that we could find, and it was two hours away. So I said, "All right." I said, "If I could get on at four a.m.," I said, "I'm off machine at one p.m." And I said, "We could do some stuff at that time." I said, "So we'll leave at I midnight." At like no, we left, we left at, at like, like eleven, I think. At ten thirty, maybe. 10? Yeah, I think it was around 10. We got all the way there. We stayed there for about two two hours, two and a half hours. Got the photos I wanted because I just bought a new camera, and I love the new camera. Um, Check out, because I think that some of the pictures got posted on the Instagram. Yeah. All right, and you took it from that so, camera. Okay. Yeah, yeah. took it with this new camera. Well, we didn't take it on the phone. We ended up posting it afterwards. Yeah. Gotcha. So okay. we got these pictures, and then at like 2 a.m., we finally left, and we got home at 4 a.m., connected to the machine and I was on the machine till 1 p.m. I heard it from my kidney nurse because she called me like, you were on at 4 a.m. Why are you on? I said, but I got to show you the pictures I got. They're awesome. And like, the <laughs> that's what you were, that's what you were selling, huh? Yeah. So we do stuff like that. And yeah. that's a lot of what kind of sold me on PD. Okay. Um, what else sold me on PD is I know with hemo, there's a giant needle. And I just don't do well with needles. I'm like, I can't stand them. I get stabbed every other week. Yeah. She gets to stab me. So I said, just take your first so, and, you know. and, and, and So how does the how does the missus feel about the needle? How do you feel about it? Um, she likes stabbing me. She enjoys it. Um <laughs> but for the chemo, it, it is a bigger gauge, I think is what it is. And I just don't do it with IVs. And basically yeah. it's like having an IV done every other week. And I'm like, uh-huh. no. No, if I don't have to do needles and I don't have to get poked every other day, then yeah, I'm fine having a freaking port come out of my belly. Yeah. It doesn't bother me any. So that's kind of the reasons why I decided to go with PD instead of hemo. Okay. All right. So yeah, I, I get to be the, the needle stabbing for. I was uh, just going to ask family. that. I was just going to ask that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so I... you, you were both involved with the training then, right? Yes. Yeah, it's very much, we joke that it's a, well, we joke and it's not a joke that it's a family affair. Yeah. Um, we have a little dog. I saw somebody ask about the ribbons yeah. in the background. And mm-hmm. that was actually, um, we won that in agility with our little dog that we got from New Mexico. All right. I saw the paw print, uh, you know, above one of those frames. Yeah. And I thought it might have to do with the dogs. And um, so we joke that it's a family affair because she's trained now so that when, Josh grabs his dialysate bags and she hears the wrinkling. Um, she knows that she has to leave the room. As really? a don't have to say a word. She just knows if she hears the wrinkling of the bags that she has to leave the bedroom because he's wow. going to turn his machine out. Yeah. Wow. And she knows it. She knows when it's the dialysate bags. Um, because I do the tubes and I do the drain bag all because, you know, it doesn't really need to be, it needs to be clean, but it doesn't need to be sterilized because okay. nothing's exposed. So she knows she could stay while that gets done, but once those dialysate beds come out, she gets up and she leaves. Really? So she totally understands that when 
the equipment and, the, and everything is kind of moved aside or something that she can come back in. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and then she knows when she can come back. So that's wow. her part in it. And my part in it is to, I do a lot of the legal stuff. So I was, before I decided I wanted to be a teacher, I was originally looking at going into medicine. So it doesn't make me queasy. Um, okay. All right. I find it kind of interesting. So uh -huh. I, it's my job to do, he gets heparin in his dialysate bags um, twice a week to keep the okay. fibrin out of his catheter. So I do that. He gets Mercera, uh, which is like hemoglobin. So it mm -hmm. helps give him energy and helps his body with the, the red blood cells and iron. Um, so he gets that every other week. Um, and then he gets testosterone every week because kidneys also work with hormones. Right, right. Um, and so it's messed up all three of those things. Well, the Mercera and the, the hemoglobin and the testosterone. So okay. that kind of becomes my job in it is to kind of do those pieces. So we, so I keep her happy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we've come up with a really good kind of system. It's not something that you can do alone. And I mean, we've got a really good support system too outside of this, but um, it's really a, a team effort, a joint effort. Um, mm -hmm because it's just it's a lot and it's a lot physically um and it's a lot mentally just kind of negotiating the time and it, we get a lot of freedom but we have a lot of limitations too so it's just right right to, you know and, and you you make a good point it see the i like that you, you you know that it fits your lifestyle better the pd and that it gives you um more energy um and that you're it does give you some flexibility, but it's, there are still some limitations. Like you still, you know, you still have to pack it if you're going somewhere, you know, and, and there, are, you still have to plan for, um, is it, you know, how long is it, how long are you on it for, is it 10 hours or nine hours? Long, nine hours. Okay. Nine hours. So, so you have to, so you literally have to plan ahead that you have to be on it for nine hours. Yep. So there, there is, you know, even though you have probably more flexibility than someone who's on hemodialysis, there is still, you know, things that, you know, um, that you have to, to kind of uh, plan for, you know what I mean? You're picking up one I'm putting down is it's not necessarily a bowl of cherries, right? There's no, it's, 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 it's hard. Yeah. It's, it's work. Uh, yeah. There's days where it is. It's just like, I just, I feel like giving up. And I just, I can't do this anymore. And I'm like, it's temporary. It's temporary. You know, I, I'm going to get that kidney. And when I do get down, my kidney nurse and, you know, my nephrologist and even my mom, you know, my, a lot of my family and friends, you know, they tell me that, Josh, you're going to get the kidney. It's not a matter of fact, if it's when, you know, it's going to happen. So, and I think I have lucked out. I got to give my nephrologist a lot of props because nice. she's very considerate of the emotions and she's, oh, what's the word I'm thinking of? She's very considerate of me, I think is what I'm going to say right now. There's another word I'm thinking of, but I, empathetic. empathetic. There we go. Empathetic. Okay. Empathetic. Very good. Very and good. It really does happen. Um, yeah. So uh, Shane said he does five cycles, 3000 milliliters. I do five cycles, uh, 2300 milliliters. All right. All and right. It seems, you know, I actually dialysate short, so I'm able to do it the nine hours. And yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It's about scheduling and I hate schedules. I am not a scheduled person. I, I can't stand <laughs> You're them. not structured. You don't like structure. No. Oh no, I am not structured at all. So this is making me become structured because I'm like, okay, I need to be at work at 8 a.m. So, so I need about an hour to get stuff done. It's going to take me about five minutes to get there. So I need to be off at 6 30 because this dog wants a walk every morning. I can't leave him. So, a walk. So, so what, what's, uh, uh, by the way, I'm a big, uh, I'm a book. I'm a really big DC Marvel comic book superhero fan. And I see that you're the collar on her is, Captain America is is it a she? I, I almost remember you saying it. Yeah, it's using, a she uh, it is. Yeah. This is her Fourth um, of July collar. She actually has one that says my dad is a kidney warrior. Oh really? But, yeah, uh, it has goose poop on it right now. But she um she decided to decorate it with some yummy smells, so it's in the laundry. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, but she does sport her kidney green most of the time. This is actually her fourth of July. She sports this collar in July. Nice, um, nice. She sports some um, red, white, and blue. But she's very nice. It's also her backup. She added some what, extra what, green to her. And what is uh, what is your puppy daughter's name? Uh, Angel. 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 I love it. 
Angel. Such a pouty. Yeah. She's 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 a uh, well mannered, very uh, very good tempered. She is uh, very tempered, and she's been like this since we've um, got her at six months. She's just been wow. so calm and very mellow. Yeah. So she's are really you, are, one of the big reasons we keep going. And Josh, are yeah. you her person? Um, I have to say yes. <laughs> um, it's supposed to be Taylor. Taylor is actually the one that bought her, and it is Taylor's dog. <laughs> she was uh, supposed to be yours, Taylor. Yeah, but she's really protective of Josh. Honestly, uh -huh. she can tell when he's not doing well um, before, um, before like really before he will tell me, and sometimes before I can tell. Um, because when he's not feeling well, she'll she'll go by his, his side and she won't leave him, and she'll snuggle up. And so typically, being she's not always a super cuddly dog, which is why she's sort of pouting right now, but. <laughs> if she's being really, really cuddly with him and not leaving him, um, oops, then that's when we kind of are like, I'm always like, hey, how are you feeling? Because she's, she just is like, if he's having a bad day or whatever, she's like glued to his side. And wow. Um, yeah. And she's yeah, been we, a good um, We got an amazing dog. That's gotten him up and walking. And, and the way we got her is she was uh, left abandoned um, in Gallup. We have a what? hospital called GIMC. And she was abandoned as a, we don't know if she's off the reservation or what. And she was found, we went to the main society looking for a dog. I was looking for a St. Bernard Rottweiler mix that I wanted. And right next to it was her. And Taylor saw her and she was just looking at her. She was the quiet one. And she was like, I like her. I really want her. So we got her, we talked to the people and we got her for a hundred dollars. Um, that was getting her spade, her shots and everything. Wow. For $100. Wow. Yeah. We and we're trying to train to Colorado and yeah, and the Humane Society in Gallup, they are an amazing place. They are a no-kill shelter and they mm -hmm. try to adopt the dogs as much as they can. They do a lot of transporting out. Yeah. They had just started their transport program when we got her about five years ago. Um and now they've really grown it and they'll transport dogs all over before it was just to Colorado. Wow. Now they transport them all over. Um so um but yeah we just really lucked out with her and she was a big part of moving here and um and she's she's really taken to the whole dialysis thing pretty well. I mean, she she lives in the sad puppy dog. Wow, island. I, I find that so amazing that all, she's but... yeah that she, you know, and, and I don't know that she truly understands that you're taking you know the toxins out and what really dialysis no. is. But you know, she understands that that that's for you, you know, and that yeah. that's your time. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> And that's that this pretty is what amazing. She has she's to pretty... do, and then you know, yeah, he's, he's not feeling good, and she's like, "Here, I will snuggle with you because you're stuck in bed." You know, right. like I said, you know, he's got good days um, and bad days. Um, you know, sometimes we hope for a good day, and we end up with a bad day, and sometimes right, um, it just it's. Dialysis is like a box of chocolates. You're never really sure what you're going to get. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you know, it's it, uh, many kidney warriors that I've interviewed have have actually compared it to a roller coaster ride, you know, and, and, yeah, and that's, you yeah. know what I mean? Cause there's one good day, you know, and, and then you have a bad day and then you may have two bad days and you may have, you know, two, two days in a row that are, are semi-decent, you know? And so it's just kind of a hills and valleys sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Yep. And, and the best way I explain the bad days, because people always ask, you know, what is it like? You know, I said, it's time. I said, imagine taking a 30 pound weights, putting him on a rope and dragging the 30 pound weights everywhere you go. I said, it doesn't wow. seem like it's a lot. Wow. It doesn't seem like it's a lot as well. But the more and more you're having to do it, the more and more you're going to get tired. And that's how I explain what it's like having those bad days is you're just dragging around weight and it just gets so tiring after a while. You're like, I just got to stop. So wow, that's a great way to explain, to explain it. Explain. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good way to explain it. I, you know, I've I've heard other people uh, use like this spoon sort of uh, analogy. That have you heard it too? Yeah. Yeah, that's me. Um, right. Yeah, and I like that too. But I like the way you've explained it. Is that you know it, it's well said, well put. I like that a lot. I it just adds, I think that yeah, it, it's uh, you know I I think it's it fits well. It really does because you know it for somebody. Um, who isn't connected to kidney disease that's watching this right now, a potential living donor. All right. You know, cross my fingers. Um, if they're watching this, you know, we want to have them on, you know, 
I always say they can't totally understand. Okay. But we can give them, you know, like a glimpse, you know, like a sliver of an understanding, you know, have them look a little bit with a lens by opening up their eyes a little bit of like using analogies like you just did now uh, and explaining how you feel and using descript descriptive words, you know, and so if we can do that, hopefully we can help them understand, you know, because oftentimes, and maybe you've run into this too, uh, is that I've interviewed kidney warriors, Josh, uh, is that they get frustrated because people seem to think that when, you know, when they hear that you're on dialysis, that you're okay, you know, that, Hey, they're on dialysis. And so they're, you know, as long as they're on dialysis, they'll be okay. You know, yeah. and, and they just don't. And, and it's oftentimes because uh, it's not talked about enough, you know, so awareness is key, you know, and, and explaining why you feel the way you do. Um, you know, yeah, you, you do get energy with PD, maybe more so than someone who's on hemodialysis because they're only dialyzing three days a week. But, you know, you're still not dialyzing regularly like a person would with a kidney, you know, yeah. and when you're dialyzing for that 10 hours, you know, it's doing what your kidney should be doing, but it's, it's doing it in that 10 hour period. You know what I mean? So it could put as, um, as uh, Steve Belcher has stated previously, it could put a lot of pressure or stress on your cardiovascular system, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, they told me, um, the average lifespan of a person on PD is about 15 years. Um, I could do it for about 15 years is about average. And said after that, it's either you need a kidney or you need to do hemo is your choices. Yeah. And then hemo right. is what, one years? So I have a maximum of 25 years to live. Giving me a kidney gives me a lot longer because peritoneal dialysis, basically it's doing is expanding my lifespan. It's just keeping me alive is all it's doing. It's not mm -hmm. allowing me to live. Being able to get a kidney and having that kidney transplant, it's going to be allowing me to do so much more. I haven't been to New Mexico in about a year and a half, two years. And because I feel like I'm not going to be able condition. to go to New Mexico yeah. until I get the kidney because there's so much logistics that are going to have to be for me to actually be able to go there. I'd have to call, have Baxter deliver stuff to wherever I'm going to stay. I have to make sure I get the machine, all my stuff. I have to make sure where I'm going has the setup. Right. And it's just so much. And I'm like, it's not worth it to me to go to New Mexico. It's you know, hard, I like, can't swim. I loved swimming. If I want to swim, I have to go make sure there's salt water because I'm allowed to swim in salt yeah, water. Yeah, right. You know, but I can't go into a jacuzzi. Yeah. You know, there's things like that. And it is, it's very limiting. And that's my biggest deal is just how limiting. And then I don't know how I'm going to feel. My biggest thing that I'm trying to avoid right now with peritoneal dialysis is not to be filled during the day. Luckily, I don't have to. Is, the is that the dwelling you mean, like having now. the having the fluid in, in my stomach? Abdomen. Yeah, because it's trying to figure if that happens. I'm in a school. Where am I going to be able to drain and refill or whatever if I'm in a school? It it just makes yeah. it so hard on that. Where I would be having to think, okay, what what do I do now on this? So the biggest thing I'm challenging is I'm trying to get a kidney before I have to be filled during the day. Um, I just did it adequacy and my numbers dropped. Luckily, I had a gout flare-up, which caused I had to take prednisone and a bunch of other stuff. That oh my gosh, you also gout. battled gout. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot. I tell um, <laughs> but doing the prednisone, it really messed up my numbers. Um, so I'm going to be redoing adequacy not next week, but the week after. Okay. And I'm praying. Do you the numbers still do? Do you quiet. still take prednisone? No. It just for the okay. flares. Yeah. Just when they so it's just a week. So okay. I'm off of it. I've been off of it for about two weeks. And mm -hmm. then hopefully, you know, when I go, it's going to show higher numbers, which will be better. And but it's been a year. It's almost been, it's been a year and a half since you started. So they said like within two, three years, it's usually like, because his kidneys are shutting down as they go. So it's just a matter of time before we end up having to be um, like filled during the day. And um, So it yeah. sounds like Shane, it Shane just, can so relate. Kind of our goal. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, exactly. To so having that, like the daily goal. And that's like, he's like, I can tolerate it in my stomach when I'm asleep. Cause I'm asleep. But like, 
during yeah. the day would just be hard. And and our other goal for a living donor is to be able to try to do it during the summer. Um, okay. Because we both teach and um, it's, it's hard not being there for your kids. This is what we do. This is, this is our, um, I had to take off Monday, um, because of a possible COVID exposure and taking off that Monday was really hard on me. Wow. Because literally me teaching is like my passion. I do it to get away from dialysis. When I'm teaching with my kids, I'm not thinking about my kidneys. I'm not thinking about my disease. I'm thinking about my kids. I'm thinking about what I'm teaching. So to me, it's my escape. So when I'm not escape. teaching, yeah. It takes it a little hard. bit out of you, yeah. That yeah. was that was probably the hardest thing two years ago, uh, where before you started dialysis was you know he every morning he'd wake up and go I'd want to go to school and I'm like you can't even get out of bed how are you gonna go work with these kids you can't <laughs> yeah how is that possible yeah. like the fact <laughs> that I went to work the day before starting dialysis <laughs> like and like my goal was I am starting back at work as soon as I can so it's gonna be about two weeks I said I'll do it in one. Yeah, you know, because I do. I just yeah. I love what I do, and just you know, sounds like you have a lot it, of passion. That's good. And it was hard, you know, being the caregiver too, and trying to split my time, and and feeling like I want to be there for my kids, but I need to be there uh, for my husband. And I think that that's something that doesn't get talked about enough either. Um, is just how much. It really, like I said, we joke, but it's not a joke about that it's a family affair, that it's it's changed how, um, you know, the dog functions. It's changed how we function. It's changed how my parents have functioned because right now um, we're living in their basement because of the financial strain of a lot of the medical stuff. And so my yes. parents have been so kind to kind of open their house. And just today we got a huge Baxter delivery with like, a bunch of boxes that we were both at school and so no. my dad had to let them in. And it's All right. So Taylor, let's talk about that though, because you know, like Shane is very familiar. All right. With PD and we have, may have some other uh, kidney warriors who may be already a little familiar with it, but other people may not be. Let's, let's talk about how many boxes get shipped. I mean, this is, I mean, you almost have to have a, a whole room for it. Right. So I will show you. this is our delivery today. Wow. For, um, and that is just the dialysate boxes. That does not include um, the big giant box that we have upstairs delivered through UPS for the, um, for the um, cassettes that like make the machine work and the okay. drain bags because the bathroom is too far away for him to reach. And so... If he needs to use the bathroom, he has to disconnect. Um, and then we also have to like put the dialysate in to like a drain bag. Um, and uh, so it's just, it is, we do basically have, we have two rooms downstairs. Um, my sisters were twins, so it was their conjoining room. And it's basically one room is, he calls it his medical office because it was okay. for all of his medical stuff. And then uh -huh. when we had to work from home, it turned into a school. Kind of a combo office. Um, and yeah. then one room is our bedroom. Yeah, yep. all right. Yeah. So it's yep. a medical it my, office. Yep, that's so what it's, we called it. It's just, it's a lot <clears throat> of, um, it's a lot of supplies. It's a lot of supplies. Yes, a lot of waste. That's the biggest yeah, issue I would say with PD is the waste. Um, all right. I feel our trash can, our neighbor's trash can, and Taylor's aunt and uncle's trash can with um, PD stuff. All so right. that's the biggest issue. We try to recycle as much as we can of the stuff, but there's so only so much you could do because you get the tubes where you can't recycle them because it's medical waste. Right. So I think that's the biggest issue I have with PD is just how much waste is involved. Yeah, it's really yeah. hard to get rid of that. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. So I was just going to ask, uh, Steve Belcher had a good yeah. questions. Um, it sounds like Taylor saw it. So do your students know yes. about your kidney yes. disease? Okay. Yep. What um, kind of discussion did you have with them about that? Um, I went into the class. I said, all right, guys, I need you to listen. They said, what? I said, all right, your masks need to be over your mouth and your nose. You know why? They're like, why? I said, because I'm on dialysis. I said, so if you want me to stay in here teaching you, your mask needs to stay on because I get a COVID, I'm out. Never had an issue with it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was basically it. They, they're like, you're on dialysis? They're like, yeah, what is it? I said, basically my kidneys don't work and I have, to, I have a machine that keeps me alive. They're like, yeah, I said, yep. Any questions? 
No? Okay. No. <laughs> so I don't really dwell on it at my work. They're aware yeah. of it. My students are aware that I do it, um, but it's not the main focus. That I right. Do it. Yeah. Uh, my employees, my uh, middle, the middle school director and my um, co-teacher that I have, they help a lot. When I go to my appointments, they're able to cover what I need. Um, they know if I'm out, I text them, hey, I'm going to be late this day because I'm on machine late or whatever like that. So the school has been very, very accommodating for me. And just having them and the Northwest Gaming Center here in Seattle have been accommodating. And we communicate, all three of us communicate, okay. and it has worked so well. Where I get my kidney appointments at 4 p.m., the place closes at 3.30. You know, they work with me at 4 p.m. That way I could get from my work to the yeah. kidney center on time. And it's just been so accommodating by both. And I literally, I'm blessed by that. Well, and I think that we just... We both of us really, with our students, were really honest with them. And okay. one of the big things that we try to see our students as is is people. It's not just students. It's not just about their academic work. It's about them as a person and what's so important the, to them and what's going on in their lives. And one of the ways that okay. we do that, besides getting to know them, is really modeling that. And so being really honest with them. When I was really struggling, so at this point, when he got sick, I was in high school. Now I'm in middle school. But um just being really honest with them and being like, Hey guys, like I'm struggling right now. My, at the time fiance is really sick and um, I teach science and we were doing biology. And so it really worked really well to get ah, all right. Um, so you could really kind of talk about it and bring in. All right. Um, and then the kids were really interested because it was something that was kind of happening to me. And so, but just being honest with them about like, Hey, this is being, um, you know, I'm struggling right now. And I've been really honest with the kids to like even just um like a week ago now i'm in middle school and so again being honest with them the same way josh did it's like hey you guys have to be really careful about these masks because here's the deal and then giving them an opportunity to ask questions about what does dialysis mean what is what does kidney disease mean and just answer their questions kind of as they come up and okay. i've had the experience in years past where they might not have questions right away but it might come up later um, mm -hmm. And then they'll they'll ask them and just using it as kind of that educational opportunity. But then also saying like, I had one kid say, okay, well, how often are you grading? So I said, well, my goal is, you know, every other week I'm going to grade. But I'm going to be honest. Sometimes we have weeks where I'm at a lot of medical appointments for my husband or he's sick. And emotionally, mentally, it's just not, it's too much. I can't, um, if we have a really big, uh, nephrology appointment coming up, it's yeah. emotionally hard for me to try to be there for you guys during the day and plan and grade. And I, I can't do it. And I yeah. emotionally, I mentally need to take care of myself and take a break. And so there really? Wow. Wow. Where I'm... you will want grades in. And I said that there won't be grades in. The kids yeah. actually love it when you're able to show that you're not perfect. Yeah. No, I like that. Mistakes, you will get more out of these kids than trying to be the perfect teacher, be the perfect person. Mm -hmm. You're uh, being real with them. Yesterday, yeah. yesterday, I had to teach the kids how to turn a repeating decimal into a fraction. The textbook gave it the most stupidest way to do it possible. I had no idea how to do it. And I told the kids, <laughs> I have no idea why this is doing it. It is stupid. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm struggling with it too. Uh -huh. We went through it. And then today, I said, You guys are going to be very mad at me today. They're like, Why? And I said, You'll find out. So I showed them. I said, you want to know how? They said, you just stick it over nine. And they're like, seriously, that's it? I said, yep, that's all you do. And they're like, that was easy. I said, yep. And it is. It's just, it's showing that, yeah, there's going to be faults. There's going to be imperfections in the teachers. And the kids love that because it shows that they could fail. They could have faults. They could have imperfections. And it's okay. Sorry, and that's what I did with dialysis. I said, there's a lot I go through. There's a lot I'm struggling with. But I'm still so coming every day. So do you find that when when you're when you're both or each of you separately, when you're being real with them and transparent, right? Um, do you find that when you're doing that, that that there's creating a better um, a better environment of uh, trust, and, and and you connect with them a little bit better yeah. that way? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it lets them know that they can um, then kind of be honest with us. And so I, like you said, I, I stress that mental health piece because it's something that isn't talked about enough and that they're, you know, the dialect of there needs to be work done and sometimes something happens that it's too much. And that just like I might, you know, say, hey guys, this was a really tough week and I'm not going to be able to get the grading done. 
Um, mm -hmm. And eventually I need to get that grading done, right? It shows them that they can kind of say the same thing. And I actually just had a student message me at the end of the day today and say, hey, I'm really overwhelmed with the amount of homework. Um, and I had this doctor's appointment. May I turn my assignment in on Thursday? Like I want to work on it. Okay, and she okay. was just really upfront. And I was like able to send back and say, hey, yeah, you got it. Like turn it in on Thursday. And so it allowed her, and this is a kid that I've had maybe, cause we've only been in school for like two and a half weeks. So I've maybe oh, had like long, two then. personal okay. interactions with her. Yeah. Very few interactions. And she felt safe enough to be honest with me because I was honest yeah, and open up. with them about it. And so it was a really important to me for them to be able to recognize, hey, I need this break and I need to figure out how I'm going to get it done. Yeah. yeah. So Steve's yeah. asking if, if you teach like in an urban school. Yes. Uh, we teach in Seattle. Yeah. yeah. We're like okay. So. All right. And uh, what what about like other teachers or faculty? How have they responded to you having kidney disease? Um, they've helped. Um, they actually come. They ask me for help. Um, the science teacher next to me, um, he will cover the morning classes if I need the morning. Um, I could teach a sixth grade with uh, the other math teacher. So we're able to combine classes when I need to leave early, especially on Mondays Whoa. for my appointments. It yeah. just works out perfect. That's when I leave is right when we're able to combine classes. She'll, yeah. she'll take my sixth grade class. Um, the director of middle school, she's able to help as well. Um, so when I need to leave early, they're able to cover, they're able to do what they need. And they're always asking, hey, do you need help? Do you need this? That's do you need teamwork. That? Yeah. yeah. And they're able to give me so much support that I'm able to get there. And it is. And, you know, the school I'm at, they're very focused on making the staff feel like a family. They're very close very with each cool. other. And it is, it's like working with a family. Mm -hmm. I think it took a while though, for us to feel comfortable doing that. Um, I make it sound like we were this honest with our kids and with our, our, our coworkers right from the get go. Um, and, and, and we really weren't originally, it took us a bit of time to kind of come to terms with that because there is so much, um, there's not enough, uh, I think emphasis on, on mental health, especially mental health as it comes Amen to, to that. Amen to illness. that. Um, like it, chronic illness is exhausting. Um, and it's exhausting for the person who has it. It's exhausting for the caregiver. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's also, so there's not enough talk about it and then there's just because there's not enough talk about it there's that fear of how am i going to be accepted am i going to be accepted am i just going to be pitied um am i as the caregiver going to just be wow. kind of shot to the side okay like, oh you're not with it um and so interesting it, it perspective bit, um of going back and forth about how do we want to approach telling people. I mean, obviously we have to tell certain people certain things, but how do we do this? And we, like I said, we, we have always had the philosophy of being kind of open and honest with our students, but mm -hmm. this was the one piece that originally we weren't sure what to do. Um, and a couple years ago was when he started to get really sick and, and my kids started being like, Hey, why aren't you here to really see the difference? All right. They Questions were really the ones. They were the ones that were like, you told us to always be honest and like something's going on and we're worried and we want to like be there for you. And that was when Josh and I really talked about it and decided that we were going to kind of start to take that leap of faith and just mm -hmm. hope that people would be supportive. Um, and, and, and we were really blessed in the support that we've gotten and, and maybe not everybody, um, but, but in, I would say most people and, then what was it a year ago we launched the instagram um january so not even a year yet yeah it hasn't even been a year wow it hasn't even been a year it feels like it's been forever um and that was when we started to kind of we had to kind of come up with a way to cope more mm -hmm. um with the exhaustions of pd and just the exhaustions of everything and um and and josh actually he said that he was going to start writing a memoir 
Are you gonna? You call really me? should. Right. You really should. Book. And he's still Seriously. Might write a book. Yeah. Um, Honestly. What were you gonna call it? I, I can't something remember. about like my year of 2020 or something. Yeah. Like uh-huh. that. Call it okay. The, um, yeah, the 2020s. I think is what I was gonna call it. Um, just because, just literally starting in January of 2020, it was just, and I mean, with the world and me in general, and I was thinking like. I'm going to talk about what was going on with me specifically in 2020 and what was going on in the world. And then what's going on with the world. Yeah. I was talking about getting the, doing the lessons, learning about PD and Australia was on fire. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's just, it's just so much that happened in 2020 that, you know, you could literally, anyone could write a book on it. So yeah. that's something yeah. we did. And, we decided and brother, I don't know that had. 2021 was any, any nicer, was it? <laughs> <laughs> it was um, a part two. Part part yeah, yeah, right. It was the sequel. Um, and what it was is we said, you know what, let's let's do an Instagram account. I said, I, I was watching a guy named Peter McKinnon. I said he does Instagram. I was looked at the Instagram and oh, I was like, let's do yeah, let's do Instagram. So I first did it with my original Instagram I have, which I just keep specifically photos, all my photography, and then we opened the second one. So let's talk about kidneys. I said, and the focus on the Instagram that I have is I want to make it to where people are aware what it's like going through kidney disease. And yeah. it doesn't mean like just peritoneal because even though you get a transplant, it is not a cure for kidney disease. You know, right. there's it's not a lot of fight you have to do. There's three different medications you have to be on while on kidney disease because mm-hmm. your immune system is now attacking that one little yeah. kidney that's keeping you alive. So right. transplants are not a cure. It's They're a prolonged, but guess what? You get to now do a little bit more. And yeah. we said doing this Instagram, it brings a lot more awareness of what it's like going through kidney disease. And I think that was the main focus of why we did the um, Instagram. I don't mm-hmm. look for sympathy. I do not want sympathy for going through this. If I wanted sympathy, I would go take medical leave. I would go take disability, go on Medicaid, Medicare, and just do whatever I wanted to do. That's not me. I work full time. I go for my master's. I have paid um, private insurance. And I'm not even on Medicare right now, which I will next year because I have to. But it's because that's not what I want. I want to live. I want to do stuff. I want to put an impact on kids. If I'm staying home, I can't do that. Yeah. And that is what drives me so I love much that. to continue doing what I want to do. Wow. And I love the passion. Crazy. I love the passion. I do. Yeah. We just Taylor, you've got to, you know, and, and, and I got that feeling, you know, when I was, you know, um, looking at your Instagram um, and, and, and you brought it today with your passion, Josh. And I like that a lot is that, You know, you seemed like a guy from your Instagram that you spoke your mind, you know, and that you in trouble. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But you know what? I like that though. I don't know what you're talking about. I like that though. I do because the the people that I most respect are the ones that speak their mind. Because the ones that don't, but they have an opinion, all right, and they don't share it with you but they share it with somebody else. All right. You know what I mean? But the person yeah. who's honest with you and just speaks their mind, you know, they're a straight shooter, you know, and, and, and I respect people like that. And I think that, you know, you're that kind of guy who's going to speak your mind. You're going to advocate for yourself or, you know, and, and then you, you're, um, you know, even Shane said it, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that you're, you're working as a teacher uh, and that you're in the pandemic you know, and, and obviously you're being careful, you know, and you're wearing a mask, you're making sure your students are and stuff like that. But it's just amazing to me because my, my wife has spent a lot of time to get her master's degree and she wants to become a teacher and, you know, she, yeah, she wants to become an English teacher and she, she's an, um, an adjunct. I think that's how it's, how it's said. Um, and she teaches, uh, at a, as a at a university while she's still working and with another job and looking for a teacher job right but yeah this is the thing that that uh that she said is that she's looking forward to teaching okay and she obviously because she's spent a lot of time to get her master's degree but what she's not looking forward to is that with just as as an adjunct she's only like correcting papers from one class and as a teacher like in middle school or high school you're correcting papers from multiple classes and so if i'm not mistaken 
you're kind of in that category, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah. just impressive to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's just amazing to me that you're finding an allotting time or, and, and, and delegating and, and doing that to fit it in and still do PD and, and do everything else. And that's just amazing to me that both of you do that. Yeah. An average middle school is about 900 students. Uh, that puts about 300 students per grade level. Um, wow. Two teachers per subject. So it puts about 150 to 160 students per um, teacher. They divide that into about five to six classes. So you get about yeah. 30 to 40 students per class. That is what you're looking at. And you are, you're doing a lot of grading. You had to grade a lot of these papers, and then you also need a plan. On top of planning, each district and state has their own things that they're wanting. They're wanting lesson plans. They're wanting observations. Okay. They want evals. They want data. They want statistics. They want to know what's going on. And there's so much teachers have to put into that. So you have to follow and guidelines to and abide by their rules. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you do. You got to take a lot of the work home. You yeah. know, they say, oh, teachers, you know, they work this. No. Um, I'm actually, after I get off of this. I got to go finish doing my lesson plans because I got to give a um, test tomorrow. <laughs> you know, all right, all right. So, yeah. You know, there so is, the, there's a lot that goes into yeah. it. And the way I work at it, mad is, respect, connected. mad respect. Thank you. Yeah, I get connected at 9 30. I don't go to bed till about 11 30 in the night because I have a little table and I'm doing grading. I'm doing my master's work. I'm doing whatever I can while connected. Multitasking. And that's okay. what I do is it is, yeah. you know, it takes about 10 minutes. It takes about 20 minutes to set the machine up. It takes about 10 minutes to connect. That's doing all the stuff I need to do. Once I've connected, I pull the computer out and I do whatever I need to do. Grade, plan, whatever I need to do. And I'll go to mm -hmm. bed about 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Yeah. Although some days <laughs> we have to make that earlier. It just kind of depends on how, how it feels. But yeah. I have my, I, you know, I have my, I wear green, some bit of green every single day, uh, <laughs> whether it's on my necklace or whether it's on my like ear saver for my mask or whether it's um on my you know on my bracelet but wherever you can yeah. yeah wherever i can i wear a little bit of green every day because he really uh -huh. is like i know he says he doesn't want sympathy and he doesn't want sympathy um but he just he really is like i have uh, my favorite masks are my masks that say i wear green for my hero because he just really is and he's just always positive he's always energetic he's always i mean he just he strives to kind of live and not just exist to to live and that was that's been our biggest push and there you know that's not to say that we haven't had our down days yeah. we've had many days of sure. tears and we've had many days of we're just not getting out of bed today because we just emotionally can't and mm -hmm. and you know why why are we continuing to do this um and it, but it comes back to, to, to what do we want and have we gotten what we wanted and, and we haven't, we haven't been able to travel. He proposed to me in London. Um, and we said in London, was, London, like the UK. Yeah. 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 It was right. Wow. Before yeah. 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 It was uh, June before June so, of 2019, 2019. Yeah. So my okay. friend had a seven, I think at that time. Yeah. So, so we, and we said that was going to be the first of multiple, you know, international adventures and we haven't quite made it there. We were supposed to go to Portugal last summer for my sister's wedding and then, or 2020 for my sister's wedding and then, but, um, you know, we're just, we haven't hit where we want to go. And, you know, when we were talking about dialysis and what is it going to mean and stuff and, and, you know, and, and what, you know, and when we get overwhelmed, we just, we kind of cling to where we want to go. And, yeah. and he always does. And the fact that we just got married in July, um, but we've been together for five years, five years. And it, it, this is just the start and we want this to just be the start. And I love my parents and I appreciate them. And I know that they're watching um, for letting us take over the basement with boxes and recycling and garbage and everything. Um, but you know, we, we want to get this transplant and, and I love you mom and dad, but move out <laughs> and yeah. start a life. I know they want to move out. Too, have, so. You know, and, and Angel needs another little four-legged sibling to go run agility so that she doesn't have to do yeah. it all. And right. I told um, okay. Taylor what I would love. I said, the moment I get this transplant, I said, I want to go to Tahiti. Yes. I don't know why. I think the only reason I said I want to go to Tahiti is because of the name. I was like, okay, okay. you can swim with pigs. Yeah. And you can swim with pigs. <laughs> 
So I want to go swim with pigs in Tahiti. So that's what I want to do after I get my kids. So. I, I didn't know pigs swam, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Well, you know, um, I, I, I think that's uh, it's ideal because sometimes you have to to reach for random things uh, because sometimes if you do just what maybe what people expect, like when they say, well, I'm going to go to Disneyland or whatever, you know, um, do something, you know, that's different, unique. I like that. That's, you know? that's I, Josh for you. That, that always <laughs> has been him. And he'll say the great. I mean. When your pickup line is, what are you eating? It looks like dog food and it works. I guess I should have known getting into this. <laughs> <laughs> what I was signing up for. Yeah, but just, right. It's been a journey and it's been a journey. It's been an interesting journey having, uh, you know, originally thought I was going to go into medicine and stepping away. And I give, um, I give our nephrologist and our dialysis team mad props because they i know josh mentioned for empathy and we just we couldn't do this without them we no. we no. almost burnt out um, that's great you got a good a team year ago. we'd only been on dialysis yeah. you know for six months and we pretty much almost burnt out and they really rallied together and put their heads together to figure out how can we do this so that they can't stop um they can't stop he's got mm -hmm. too much to live for and and he needs to get there and they really rallied around us to make it um you know as doable as possible and obviously they can't get rid of every challenge but but again like they said, did what they, they could they did what they, they could and they they did a lot awesome. and it that's allowing great. us to to keep going that's and they're good. okay with me just reading their clock <laughs> really <laughs> kind of really a little bit. i um i started a medication and it got me really high it, uh -huh. medication. Right, but, right. Right. and i decided to buy a uh, googly eyes on amazon uh -huh. And I took the googly eyes to the kidney center the next time I went and put googly eyes on the clock. I then bought a package of mustaches and stuck a mustache on the clock. And then I now wearing a hat. Out. So the next time you put arms and legs on it. So, you know, I just do random you know, stuff. You and they find love ways it. to. Well, they have. You, a clock does have, you know, hands. So I guess you can make the other <laughs> limbs. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, so. It's just, yeah. It's been a big. You know, it is a it's journey. Been a, it's an amazing journey. Yeah, it's it's a it's a journey, and I have so much admiration, so much respect uh, for what each of you is doing. Um, and I I am really glad that that we're able to do this. We're coming to a close now, but I would like to say, okay, what I'd like to do is just give you a moment to, you know, it's what we call our shout out moment. All right, whom would you like to shout out? Uh, whom would you like to thank? Whom would you like to give tribute to before we end the show i'm gonna put you well, solo while you first, do that first i gotta do my mom hi mom because i know you're watching hi my family because i know most of my family's watching i know my auntie Lori's watching um i gotta give a big shout out as well to um taylor's parents uh nick and dinah they have helped a lot they have been there and they've helped so much um it just means a lot taylor's family um i gotta give a shout out to the northwest kidney center just being there the poly clinics nephrology department they've done great uh, my school that I'm at right now. I don't know if I could give their name, so I won't, but you know, I would if I could. Um, just so much support, just having the support and having the help that I have. Um, thank you guys so much. I do appreciate it. And I'm able to do what I do because of that. Just having, yeah, the people that have seen not just kidney disease, but have seen us as people and have seen the people behind it. And yeah, the Northwest Kidney Center and, and the Poly Clinic nephrology has just done an amazing job at um seeing josh for who he is and the quirky amazing guy that he is and, and helping us with kidney disease but helping with who he is and, and not just it means the world to be seen as a person um and not just a disease and i know that that can be emotionally taxing um we uh, lost one of our nurses from northwest kidney center who decided to kind of take a hiatus and i really respect her for that um, because she was amazing and she poured her whole heart and soul into her patients every day. And um, it, it, you need to take care of yourself too as a caregiver. So just our caregivers for for giving so much of themselves um, when we know it's it's um, tough for them to do too. It's just been huge. Um, and it's made us be able to take this journey. And if there's a donor out there, um, whether you match, a positive or whether you're a donor for another 
any patient, it, any donors out there watching, just a shout out to you guys. Um, I have a cornea transplant, and so it's just organ donation hits us in multiple ways. So yeah, just thank you to anybody who's an organ donor, whether it's a living organ donor or whether it's an organ donor um, in the event of something traumatic. It just it means the world to both of us, everybody who it touches to us and our families and to other kitty warriors and their families out there. Yeah. So. Awesome. And even awesome. if you can't be if those who tried, I need to make one more shout out to Grace. Yes. Okay. Um, Grace is my pastor in New Mexico. Um, the moment she found out she was my blood type, she went and got tested right away. Awesome. She got all the way to the very last step to where it was the artery and found out she was disqualified because one of the arteries was too small. Oh, and really? She gave so much. And she's the one that actually married us. Um, she was, she was the, the one who was the minister then. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I got to give her, she's known me since I was even before I was born. She's known my family forever. And I just got to give a big shout out to her. And thank you, Grace, so much for trying and doing what you did. You do mean a lot. And I think about you every day. It just, it means the world to us and your faith and your support that the donors out there and that God has a plan just means the world to us. Yeah. So even if you're not sure if you can donate, yeah, it means the world. Yeah. Try. try. Biggest thing I say. Even if it's not for me, it's for anyone. Just try because they need everyone. There's too many people are dying because they can't get a donor. I think is what it is. And it's not just me. It's a lot of people. I think it's the best way. And to it means that. so much. Yeah. Amen. You're right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, this has been great. Uh, very inspirational. And um, I just, uh, again, I have so much admiration for your, your strength and toughness because of uh, what you your journey so far and what you go through. I know it's not easy. I can only imagine, you know, the the roller coaster again that you go through. But um, I'm I, I'm 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 also elated that you have each other. Um, you know that I don't believe in coincidences. I really don't. And yeah. I'm I'm so happy that you guys have such a, a strong foundation together and that you build each other up. It sounds like a a winning combination right there. Yep. I dare anyone to challenge us. <laughs> that's right. It has, but yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, come out on top. He is. He's a warrior. He's going to I'm sure he will. I'm. I'm sure he will. Um, uh, and I ask this to everybody. Okay. Um, in the last, the last, uh, I did an impromptu show just on Sunday because within about, I'm going to say about a week, there were three people, three kidney disease patients who had kidney transplants and um and all three of them had been on my show at one time so <laughs> so yeah. i asked this to everybody okay is that whenever you get the call whether it's from a living donor or from a you know deceased donor angel either or can you get the call hit me up and let me know about it because what i also like to do okay i i, I feel like it's a requirement that because it's such a big deal, okay? It's a second a, a second gift of life, right? Is that I ne I always want to celebrate that transplant. And so I'll go live and I'll celebrate and I did that Sunday with three and you know, I Steve Belcher and I we went live and we celebrated the you know, the basically gave thanks and we celebrated that three kidney warriors had been, you know, had gotten a kidney transplant, you know, and, awesome. and I'm, if I don't know about it though, I can't do that, you know, and I want to do that. So just, that's my only small request is, you know, find me, hit me up on Instagram, uh, or, or, uh, wherever Twitter, you know, or YouTube and just let me know about it so I can celebrate it. Okay. We will indeed. Yes. All definitely. right. Well, thanks, you guys. Thank oh, you very much for coming on. Later. I hope Thank it's sooner versus so later. I really do, because, you know, God, God does ma magnificent things. And I know that uh, sometimes it doesn't always happen in our time, but God's time. But, you know, I hope that his time is very soon for you. I really do. All right. I'll be praying Sorry. for both. I'll be praying that you get a kidney transplant very soon, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You're welcome, guys. Have a blessed evening, okay? Thanks. You Thank too. You. Take care. Thanks, All right. everyone. Bye-bye.
Hey guys, so thank you so much for tuning in. All right, so Josh and Taylor were great guests. Um, we got a little glimpse of their journey. All right, man, it, to me, it's an inspiration. Um, everything that they do and everything that they prepare for in regards to their jobs uh, and the way they lift each other up is also, um, it, it's it's amazing. I love their, their, their dynamic. Um, you know, and I like that he's so outspoken that he speaks his mind because that, you know, mental awareness is something that's, that needs to be more talked about and, you know, God bless him for trying to get, get more awareness for that. And I love that they're transparent with their students about what they're going through. So it's just so many nuggets, so many good things that they brought to the table. Um, really great show. Thanks, Steve. I think so too. Um, it just very inspirational. So if you, if you're getting to this late, all right, watch the replay and watch it all the way through, please. All right. Because you need to hear the whole story from, from Josh and Taylor, the complete interview. So you can understand, all right, what it will mean for not only Josh, but for Taylor when he gets a kidney donor. So if you don't, have the health, the good health to become a living donor. Share this and donate a share. All right, please share this to a Facebook group or share this, share this with, uh, you know, Twitter, share it with Instagram, share it to, I don't know, on your text as a text message, you know, <laughs> take a snippet from your computer and print a page out and put it on your, uh, put it on your bulletin board in your lunch, uh, the break room you know, at work, wherever, um, just do whatever you can to, to cast this out there to as many people as possible. You're very welcome, Rexanne. Um, I'm so glad that we did this tonight because this is a beautiful story, an amazing story with two people who are in love that support each other, build each other up and they're building a life for each other. And we want to give him a second life, a gift of life. All right. So please be inspired. But act on inspiration, all right? Act on inspiration because many people are inspired, but there are fewer people that actually act on inspiration. So apply to be a, a donor now, all right? So the phone number is down below. There's also a, a, a link, and I can put this in the comment section so it's so the link is clickable, and you can go to the website and, and apply to be a living donor. All right. So please, even if you're not, all right, A, um, if you're not blood A at all, whether it's negative or positive, the paired exchange program, um, a voucher program, swap program, whatever you want to call it, all right, takes care of all that. It speeds up the process. Uh, anybody who's looking for a kidney donor and you're not the right blood type, but you do apply, then the, there is a organ. There are organizations that work together. They collaborate to find swaps and they do an exchange. So it does speed up the process for Josh to get a kidney transplant, even if you're not the right blood type. So apply to be a living donor now. All right. And if you can't be a living donor, you don't have good health, then please donate the share. All right. Click on that. Smash that share button. All right. Make sure that you send it out there and maybe. All right. God will help us. God does magnificent things. And maybe if we share this and we do put forth some action after inspiration, that he'll help us by sharing it. And it'll be found by somebody who will act on inspiration, who's healthy and becomes a living donor for Josh. All right. So thank you very much for watching tonight. Continue to comment. All right. Continue to share this. Let's keep the algorithm going so that this is that this is active on Facebook and YouTube and that this is going to be visible when someone puts in the search engine kidney or living donor or kidney disease. Okay. If we keep this active, then the algorithm will make this visible when someone's searching for anything that that's connected with the hashtag or a key tag of, of that nature. All right. So God bless everyone. Thank you for watching again. All right. I appreciate your, you following. I appreciate everything that you do. And you can always uh, email them with questions as well at joshkidney at gmail.com. All right. Latoya Dixon. Latoya Dixon is going to be on my show very soon as well. 
Uh, Latoya Dixon is also looking for a kidney donor. Thanks, Latoya. So they're saying thank you. Okay, Taylor and Josh are saying thank you. All right, great people. If you haven't gotten connected to them, you can find them on Facebook and you can find them on Instagram. Get connected with them and let's make sure that we that we have that we just basically give them encouragement, support. You know, make sure that they're part of the kidney disease community. The more we feel united, the the less we feel alone. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you again. I'm gonna say peace. I'm out and find the outro. I I set it aside for a moment when I was doing my show. I got a I had it under some books. Let me find it. All right, here it is. All right, here it is. Here's the outro. Thanks, guys, for watching. Peace. I'm out. Oh, here it is. I'm out. Check the mic and make sure it sounds right, boys. Sound right, boys.